Good evening, good evening, and welcome to Friends Forum, which is a presentation of the Friends of the University Libraries. My name is Margaret Telfer, and I'm the president of the board of the Friends. And um, we're not the public library friends, we're friends with a difference. We advocate for the university's libraries and put on events unlike all others, uh, like this one. Um, our goal is to raise awareness of the magnificent resources to be found in the university libraries, which most people don't realize are open and available for use by everyone in the community. And we try to promote that um, in the broader community outside the university. We would love you to become a member of the Friends and enjoy access to the light, borrowing access to the libraries um, and our members only events. Uh, befriending these libraries means that you recognize that their vast resources hold the keys to our understanding of just about anything, of current events and of future events and anything you would want to know can be found in one of the award-winning libraries at this university. As a member of the Friends of uh, the University Libraries, you have borrowing privileges, something that I really like for research projects, and they always have my book club books, which is good. We'd love you to sign up to become a friend on the back of your program. There's, uh, you can tear it off and hand it in to uh, one of us that has one of these uh, board member badges tonight, or you can go online and sign up. Anyone who joins this week is eligible for a drawing that we're going to have for um, a free tickets to our Feast of Words event, which is a dinner at the Campus Club here. And uh, the speaker is David Odie. He's a bioengineer, he's a cancer researcher. It's going to be fabulous. So if you're it's, thinking about joining, do it now because you could win these free tickets. Um, Friends forums are designed to do more than just catch the latest hot author on book tour. Our goal is to present information on issues of interest to a wide or narrow audience, which is why we call it a series for curious minds. You all qualify. Like the libraries, our subject range is vast. Um, like I said, our next event is about cancer. The one after that is Steve Sack, the political cartoonist. And after that, we have an annual poetry event with Jim Moore. So please join us. You'll find great, stim great conversations in stimulating company. Last spring, as we planned tonight's event amid swirling allegations and seemingly endless news coverage, we wondered what Me Too might be now. I remember hearing one powerful man of my acquaintance say, this will blow over. And feeling the bile sort of rise in me prompted me to add momentous or momentary to the title of tonight's event because we wanted to know, is, did, has this changed our culture or is it going to move on? We have an extremely knowledgeable panel to address the larger implications of Me Too. And here to introduce them to you is Wendy pratt Luger, our university librarian, dean of libraries, and McKnight presidential professor. Wendy. Thank you. Well, thank you, Margaret. Uh, as, as she just said, uh, my, my role is here, and I get to welcome you to this second in the series of the Friends Forum, a series for curious minds. Now, the, the title of tonight's event, uh, hashtag, Me Too, Momentous or Momentary. And indeed, it's a topic that has generated intense scrutiny and a, a real national conversation. When Tarana Burke coined the term Me Too in 2006, she was reacting to her own experience with sexual assault. And she wanted to do something to help women and girls, particularly those of color. So she created a MySpace page. How many of us remember MySpace? MySpace. Just how far we've come, at least technologically speaking. Tarana's message was, you are not alone and that there is empowerment in empathy. And I suspect that's what drew many of us here tonight, to share our common experiences, to understand how each of us can facilitate real and lasting social change. Now some of you might say, why the hashtag was added? 
Whether you first knew that as the number sign or perhaps the pound sign or perhaps you just remember tic-tac-toe, um, it's an incarnation as a hashtag has changed the language for millions around the world. It can indicate where you're posting from, what you're posting about, and most importantly, it has shaped elections, launched social movements, and become a defining symbol of our digital age. Its story started on a bare bones social networking site called Twitter back in 2007, and today it's certainly an international phenomenon. So how do we marry these two disparate notions? A problem as old as all time, sexual assault, and the symbol of the digital age, the hashtag movement it spawned. Where do we go next? That's the context for tonight's discussion with women who represent all ages and all stages, from campus champions to community spokespersons, and all of us in between, the rest of us women and men, who have a great stake in the conversation that continues. And with that, I'm very pleased and honored to present tonight's moderator, University of Minnesota Regents Professor and Friends of the Library's board member, Sarah Evans. Sarah spent her career teaching women's history here at the University of Minnesota. Her research on the history of feminism as a social movement grew from her own involvement in civil rights, anti-war, and women's activism. Her publications include Personal Politics, The Roots of Women's Liberation in the Civil Rights Movement and the New Left, Born for Liberty, A History of Women in America, and Tidal Wave, How Women Changed America at Century's End. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Sarah Evans. Thank, thank you, Wendy. My role here, in addition to chairing, is to provide some historical context. You might have guessed that, given my resume. And Me Too has a long history. Sexual violence is an assertion of power. Most commonly, but not always, because there certainly are male victims as well, and we should never forget that, it has been um, an expression of male dominance, and it is also used to express the dominance of one group of men over other groups of men. As, for example, when rape is used as um, an instrument of war. Think Bosnia, think the Congo, and this goes back for generations. In our society, this pattern has been deeply inflected by hundreds of years of racial domination. From slavery, racially based slavery in this country, through the era of segregation, um, all of which offered white men free access to black women's bodies as a way of enacting that racial domination. And the flip side of that, of course, was that black men couldn't have any direct connection with white women without risking their lives. I mean, just looking straight in their eye, and certainly a whistle in the street, whatever. Um, they, and routinely, lynching was justified by the charge of rape, even though most of the time, we have good research on this, what was happening is that there were black men who were encroaching on the economic power of whites. And they were eliminated extra legally with the charge of rape as a justification. For centuries, victims have been silenced. Public life has been dealed a male arena, so women there are fair game. Women who come to work, to sell in a market, um, to, to engage in public life. If, they, if something happens to them, it's probably their fault. We know these assumptions. And private life, the domestic family arena, 
was presumed to be patriarchally dominated. Whatever happened there was legal, almost by definition. There was no such thing, you know, there was the rule of thumb in common law that a man could beat his wife with a stick no thicker than his thumb. These images are deeply embedded in our culture, that there are good women and bad women, virgins and whores, virtuous women and sluts. And all of that conspires to make it very, very hard for women to speak or to be heard. It's important to never forget that resistance has always been there in the lives of women who fought back and resisted. As an organized force of resistance, it's much more recent. And what I want to do is take you through a very quick through time, trip through time in this country just to show you that Me Too, which is the latest iteration and the biggest, has antecedents. We stand on other shoulders. The anti-slavery movement. Speakers like Sojourner Truth, Harriet Jacobs, and the Grimke sisters, who were the first two were former slaves, and the Grimke sisters were white women who grew up on a plantation in South Carolina and spoke eloquently about the degradation of their black sisters sexually under slavery as well as other ways. In the 1870s, the Women's Christian Temperance Union set up um, lunch rooms and dormitories for working women, sales girls, women in, in uh, textile industry, to provide them a safe place because they knew these young women in public spaces were in danger, their purity was in danger. The WCTU didn't think deeply about the issue of race or the dangers of domestic workers, for example. In the 1890s, Ida B. Wells, a black newspaper editor in Memphis, Tennessee, who was driven out because she exposed the economic underpinnings of lynching, um, started a, f a mostly female anti-lynching movement. Um, mostly black female anti-lynching movement, and she also constantly railed against the parallel assumption that black women were sexually promiscuous and available and deserved whatever happened to them. White women didn't join that battle against lynching and that intersection of race and sex until the 1930s when Jesse Daniel Ames, a white Texas woman who knew that the political power in Texas was totally controlled by the Ku Klux Klan, began a campaign against lynching. And her job, her intent was to mobilize white women to say, not in our name. You don't kill black women supposedly for our honor. Um, but the bigger pushback starts in the 1970s and 80s. And we could argue about, do you call it second wave or do you call it, what do you call it? But there was an upsurge of feminist activism and a big piece of that had to do with taking on the issue of sexual violence. Take back the night marches, for example, which we still have, um, were begun in that time. Shelters for battered women, safe places for women to go, hotlines for them to call when they were raped, all come out of that period in the 1970s. And at the same time, feminist lawyers and policymakers began to create new legal concepts, some written into law, others um, developed through, uh, through court cases, like marital rape. Until then, there hadn't been a concept that you could be, if you were married to someone, that person could rape you because that was your duty. Or sexual harassment, a complicated issue to, be, to name what happened to women in public spaces, um, often from men they didn't know, but also from men that they worked with. That issue, which um, one of our panel members was one of the, did a pioneering case on that, 
became a big public issue in 1991 when Anita Hill testified in the Senate Judiciary Committee um, to a group of skeptical white men about her experience of sexual harassment by Clarence Thomas. Her bravery ignited a national conversation, and I remember at the time, because most of us of my age were riveted to the television during those hearings, and afterwards realized that it had ignited conversations in public settings, but also a lot of private settings, where men would say, oh, you know, do you think that was a big deal? And the women they cared about would say, that happened to me. Let me tell you my story. Some of us thought that would be the big turning point. And um, we have to admit that it, it wasn't. Because in 2006, Tarana Burke, a survivor and a civil rights organizer, initiated the use of social media as a method for women to speak out and support each other by creating the term Me Too. Um, there was by then a substantial movement to respond to survivors, but she was extremely aware that most women who experience sexual violence live in extreme isolation. And they needed to hear those empathic words, I get it, it happened to me. And then, of course, as we all know, in 2016, the revelations about Harvey Weinstein, and then a rolling number of other famous men. In response to that, the hashtag MeToo became a kind of firestorm, and we still are in the middle of that one. Of course, we also know that this very year, Christine Blasey Ford, with immense courage and poise, testified about an attempted rape on the part of Brett Kavanaugh, who was also nominated for the Supreme Court. And we know that she was not believed by a majority of people on that committee and in the Congress. But there's a lot of testimony out there that the drumbeat of rage has not stopped. There is a refusal to be silenced. So here we are, one year after the Me Too went viral, joining millions of others, because it's viral around the world, um, as we were talking about at dinner, to ask ourselves, what is the future of this movement at this time? The organizing idea for this panel, I think, has been eloquently expressed uh, by Gia Tolentino in The New Yorker, um, who began a piece about that anniversary saying, is hashtag me too this jagged, brutal, contentious, and profound collective reckoning with the extent to which men have been allowed to abuse their power, an epochal shift toward a better and more equal society? Or is it fleeting? A piece of time that we can record and later revisit, but that we could never in this country under a 20 times accused of sexual misconduct president make last. Hmm. So we're putting it to ourselves and to you. How do we mobilize that anger into an effective political force that won't disappear in the face of backlash and ridicule? How do we create healing spaces for the women who have been harmed? This is now the primary concern of Tarana Burke, the founder of Me Too. How do we articulate a compelling vision of a world in which women and men share equally in power and respect? And how do we women work with our male allies to create the deep cultural shift that that kind of vision requires? I'm acutely aware that all those questions carry different resonances when you view them through the lenses of race, culture, generation, and class, as well as gender, and that this list could get longer. But we have to have the conversation. As Tarana Burke said, and I invite you to go look at her TED talk that just, I think, went up this week, 
We owe future generations nothing less than a world free of sexual violence. I share her belief that we can build that world, but the road is long and complex. I'm really excited to hear the thoughts of my co-panelists, and after they have time to speak, what's gonna happen is I will invite them to talk amongst themselves, you know, engage with each other because they speak from very different experiences. <coughs> and I promise you that by 8.30, we will open the discussion to you in the audience because we all have to walk out of here feeling like this is for us to figure out what to do together. Together, I hope we'll make it possible for all of us to leave with a sense that we can make a difference. So at this point, it's my enormous privilege to introduce you to the panel, and I am now going to walk over and sit with them for the rest of the evening. <laughs> um, all right, sound people, should I pick this up? Yes. Yes, yes. I'll say yes, do it, all right. There we go. Okay, I'm gonna introduce, I think it's on. It's on, okay, good. I'm gonna introduce them in the order in which they will speak. Um, each will take about 10 minutes, and they will just go from one to the other. I don't need to orchestrate it after that. Um, the first speaker is Carolyn Chalmers, who is a retired director of our Office for Conflict Resolution here at the university. She did that between 2000 and 2014. In the 1980s and 90s, Carolyn litigated employment discrimination cases, including many regender sex discrimination cases here at the U. She also um, was the chief litigator for a pioneering case on sexual harassment for a faculty member in the, in the law school, not law school, medical school at the University of Iowa. And I, I think she can bring some of that experience uh, to this discussion because she was working at a time when that wasn't a clearly delineated sec, uh, concept of legal theory, but it was in the works. She served as a consultant to Carleton College on preventing sexual assault and harassment from 1994 to 2000. And in 2000, she was named as one of the top 50 Minnesota women attorneys for the decade of the 90s. The next speaker will be Lindsay Middlecamp, who is a special assistant US attorney. Um, before becoming a prosecutor, Lindsay worked as a civil litigator and later as an assistant city attorney for Minneapolis. So some of you may know her from a variety of things. She serves on the board of Stop Street Harassment, a national nonprofit. And in that capacity, as well as her capacity as a childhood sexual abuse survivor and rape survivor, she is a frequent speaker on issues related to sexual violence and gender-based harassment. Her advocacy on gender issues has been featured by the Huffington Post, BBC, and others. And her pre professional work has included Fair Housing Act cases representing indigent women whose housing was compromised because of sexual violence and harassment. And most recently, she's been involved in the prosecution of child pornography and exploitation. And she has a whole other career on Twitter that I'll let her talk about that is all addressed to these issues. Our third speaker is Simran Mishra, current student body president at the University of Minnesota, Twin Cities. Um, so you're a senior about to finish um, and head off into the world and change it. <laughs> she majors in finance and she minors in global studies, math and business analytics, um, and is passionate about advocating for students. She has been working all of her time here as a student in student advocacy and a lot of that on the issues of sexual violence and harassment. And our fourth speaker is Mary Muhammad, who when I, was typing these up, I just typed in without stopping to think, a force of nature. <laughs> I know Miriam. Um, we are both on the board of a small nonprofit, and I've seen up close her deep wisdom and her extensive contacts and knowledge 
and her commitment. Her 30-year background includes extensive experience in program analysis and evaluation in, in the private and nonprofit service arena. I'm never surprised to learn about yet another on your long list of government, nonprofit, and profit agencies and local communities who call on her consulting skills. She's a co-owner of Hoyo? Hoyo? Yes, Sambusa. It's a company founded on the goal of employing and empowering Somali women. And I know of a number of groups of Somali women for which she serves as a leader and facilitator. Um, so this is a, a rich opportunity for all of us, and I'll let you all take it off. Carol, <laughs> off you go. Well, I thought that I would take us back to the 1970s and 80s and talk to you a little bit about this case at the University of Iowa, um, some of the lessons I learned from it, and then bring it forward to reflections on how legal initiatives complement or are in tension with some of the Me Too, some of the aspects of the Me Too um, movement. Uh, my client was Jean Jew, and she came to the University of Iowa in 1973 as a newly um, completed physician. She had her MD degree from Tulane at the age of 24. Um, she was a first, she is a first generation Chinese American, a small, pretty, uh, demure, demure and a few months after starting there in a postdoc, she saw a cartoon from Playboy posted on the wall of the hallway in her department, and her name was written across the naked woman. This was six years before Catherine McKinnon's book on sexual harassment that came out in 1979 and taught us how important it was to name it. And it was 45 years before the Me Too movement that taught us how important it is to tell it. Um, I started working with Jean in 1983. Uh, we had an eight year um, sexual harassment complaint against the University of Iowa that took us through an internal university hearing, a federal district court trial, and an Iowa State jury trial, um, all of which um, she won. Um, she became kind of a cause celeb in Iowa City and at the university. And just this year, I went down to Des Moines because she was inducted into the Iowa Women's Hall of Fame for the contribution and the courage um, of this case. There are a lot of things we learned, and I won't, um, I won't let myself go there, but I do want to talk with you about a few things. One is the invisibility of her pain. I don't think that most of the administrators at Iowa thought she was lying. I think they believed her. They just didn't really see it. It was outside their field of vision, especially in relation to the male colleagues who actually, over the 10 years from 73 to 83, who had a, a campaign of sexual innuendo against her and always the suggestion she was getting ahead because she was engaging in sex with her senior male mentor. And, and this is a little, there's a little aside here. I think, and I'd be interested to hear from, it, from you people and the panel, I think this is kind of true of Anita Hill and Christine Blasey Ford, that I don't know that those men on the Judicial Committee didn't believe them, I just think their pain didn't count. And it didn't count when put up against an enraged man who believed he was entitled to the capstone position in his career. And that's a little nuance that I'd love to have a meme for. 
even, and I think often, actually, I'm not saying it's, it's uh, always, but uh, we may be believed, but the pain doesn't count when it's that kind of comparison. So the invisibility of the harm to Jean was very apparent to me um, and to her. Uh, the other thing is the cover-up. And academic institutions, I'm afraid to say, are no better. Maybe a little worse in some cases in terms of circling the wagon around the men who are accused of misconduct and protecting them and the institution rather than help correct. And, and in another interesting question I have is why so many universities are uh, in the limelight on this. Michigan State, Ohio State, Baylor, Penn State, you can go on and and universities are being mentioned almost as frequently as the Catholic Church or the entertainment industry. So I think that's a very puzzling and, and, and difficult problem for us since it is in these institutions that our young people learn norms and they learn a lot of them by watching what we do, not so much what we say. For Jean, the deepest harm was the fact that the institution didn't correct it or didn't take action. And I think this is uh, common. We all can run into a jerk or a bully or an abuser, but when you feel that that has happened and that you have rights to a correction and you go to the institution where you have invested a big segment of your life and you say, help me, and they say, I don't know, I'm not really seeing you, I'm not really hearing you. It's a very, very big wound. And I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, I'm not suggesting that legal action is a panacea. I know very personally how expensive it is, how male-dominated that system is, how it relies on and depends on fair-minded uh, judges and juries. Uh, and I know how limited its impact is unless the Supreme Court uh, takes up the megaphone, and we're not going to see much of that in the near future. Uh, but for Jean, having a federal judge after hearing to 20, 25, 30 people say these statements are false and she deserves promotion to full professor and everybody, not everybody, but all the administrators in this institution, the University of Iowa, which and our judge was a great booster and a big alum of the law school, he said, I want all those administrators to read my decision because they don't know what their responsibilities are. That was like a bomb. It was a grace. It wiped that shame off her reputation. Um, and so it was, it was um, a good tool for that particular problem, and we, and we were fortunate to have the outcome that we did. Um, the Me Too movement, a few comments about that. Obviously, um, it's accomplishing things we never could have done and can't do in the legal setting. Uh, one of those things is aggregating women who've had experiences in institutions or with men so that we reach a tipping point. Um, we know in some cases judges won't let you bring in other women who've had similar experiences that might reveal a pattern. We know in Bill Cosby's case the first trial did not um, come to conviction in part because the judge didn't allow other women in and the second trial the judge did. So we're limited in that ability to aggregate and, and the Me Too movement is aggregating women and they're and that's reaching tipping points, and that's why 200 and plus men, according to the New York Times, in prominent positions, have lost their jobs because their boards of directors or their CEOs have decided that the misconduct um, shouldn't be tolerated. It's also providing an agency for victims, which I think is very healing. 
it's really taken off internationally in places where we haven't had any recourse or place for people to talk about it. Um, I think that's a wonderful thing. And I think it's a wonderful thing with young women in particular because we have such trouble getting women to come forward and make complaints or talk about these stories. And for some reason, this Me Too vehicle is something that um, all women are, or many women are using, but certainly um, young women. Going forward, a few cautionary notes. It won't surprise you uh, to know that I feel, uh, with my training, caution, uh, I feel a caution about the um, fundamental fairness that we need to have if we are going to have a movement that provides punishment. So punishment, in my opinion, is different from speaking out. And the speaking out part of the Me Too movement I see as being very productive. When it takes on the role of punishment, then I think it's, um, it's very important that there's fundamental fairness. One person's point of view is not enough in order to punish. Um, we have tools like investigations and hearings and trials. Uh, and I personally, although they're imperfect, feel that they're better um, suited. And going back to the wound, the wound of the institution, I just, I was reading the New York Times this morning, the business section, the report on the moonness, uh, moon this uh, investigation at CBS came out today. And here's what they said. Many of the company's employees, including high-ranking executives and even members of its board, were aware of the formal, former chief executive's alleged sexual misconduct and subsequent efforts to conceal it, conceal it, yet no one acted to stop him. So I think, I'm hoping Me Too will focus on institutions and institutional misconduct. Um, and I'm not, I'm not sure how much it is yet, but I, I mean, what we want is we want it to be like when somebody lights up a cigar in his office and you can walk up and say, huh, knock it off. You can't do that in here. We want it to be that easy. All right, I am kind of bridging the legal perspective with the social and student perspective, I think. And uh, as Sarah noted in my introduction, um, I have a combination of both professional and personal and then what I'll call kind of intermediary vocational perspectives on this Me Too movement and the values and issues that uh, underlie it. So I am an attorney. I'm currently a prosecutor, but previously have been in civil litigation. Um, and in, additional to some, in addition to some of my professional connections to these topics that I'll talk about, I also have personal connection, both uh, my own lived experience and that of several family members, um, which have only now, after many years of cultural movements, been the kind of conversations we can have as a family uh, to talk about what's happened to us individually in our lives. Uh, I'm lucky to have a supportive family, but something I'll talk about is how easy it is for the initial family reaction to sexual violence or harassment to be either the supporting or chilling factor that dictates what kind of experience a person can have in healing. Um, in addition to that, or kind of at the, at the intersection of that, I spend a lot of time on Twitter, as Sarah noted. I'm sensing that my lapel is moving, so I'm gonna try to center myself. Um, Mostly my work on social media since about 2013 has focused on uh, the, what we can call casual sexism that I think fits into these structural and institutional uh, systems of oppression that are finally coming, if not to a head, then to a larger conversation. Uh, in 2013-14, I started um, initiating conversations with street harassers and filming conversations with street harassers to ask them a little bit more about what they thought they were bringing to the conversation and why they thought women in public wanted their views on their body parts. Um, that project um, 
was about the same time that several other women, many other women had previously been doing anti-street harassment work, but thanks to YouTube and Twitter and Facebook, um, very quickly picked up a lot of acceleration across the country and across the world, um, which is the board that I'm now on, Stop Street Harassment, primarily does international and national resources and awareness raising on how public spaces for many women and men is the first venue where unwanted or uninvited sexualization can happen. And the way we react to and educate around that instance of sexual harassment can inform how people treat others in their personal relationships, in professional settings, um, and beyond. And more recently on social media, I do a project called Shirtless Shamers, where I take online misogyny and juxtapose it against um, the hypocrisy and the, and the double standards that women are held to in men and that we all receive from a very young age about women's bodies being inherently sexual and inappropriate and men's bodies being the default and the neutral. So by way of example, if a man posts online, um, women shouldn't dress like such sluts, that's why they get harassed when they show cleavage and you look at their own publicly available um, photo album and it's all topless pictures of themselves holding their body in suggestive ways, um, then I'll, I'll collage those together to show that um, the very men who are typically enforcing or reinforcing slut-shaming standards that uh, are, they didn't invent, they certainly didn't come up with themselves, they are simply reciprocate, or repeating and regurgitating what they've heard, um, are often things that they haven't themselves internalized for their own conduct and how that fits into this larger conversation about um, women being entitled to respect as a default rather than based on how they dress or what spaces they go or how they behave. So just as disorganized as my connection to this topic is, so too are my notes, so I apologize. Um, but when we talk about the Me Too movement um, and, and my perspective on where this fits in, one thing that I'm struck with is this, this saying, um, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Some of the work that I do has included doing workshops at school settings, uh, but I also had an opportunity several years ago to do a workshop at a senior facility on the history of street harassment and inviting narratives and talkbacks on um, the people in attendance and their own experiences with sexual harassment, either in the workplace or in public spaces or sometimes in personal relationships. And I want to echo what we talked about at dinner, that this tonight is not necessarily the venue where we're inviting everyone to share their own anecdotes, even though I'm sure there are many in the room. Um, but at those talkbacks, we did share anecdotes. And what really struck me was that the very same conduct that the current 15 and 16 year old girls were sharing that they were experiencing, being followed from the bus stop, uh, being publicly masturbated at, being harassed by colleagues at their first jobs, being harassed in their own household or sexually bullied at school, were things that current 70 and 80 year olds were recalling had happened to them and had severely discouraged their participation in certain things, had dictated where they lived, what bus route they felt comfortable taking, what they wore, and a lot of choices that uh, affected them for life. And so that's discouraging. It's very discouraging to know that as much progress as we're making, current preteens and young teens are still getting a lot of the same early uh, exposure to sexual violence, even if it's not assault in the home or assault by a trusted loved one, um, it's still a cultural value that we have yet to really eradicate and stop from infecting the next generations. Um, other things that come to mind in terms of under this kind of depressing umbrella of we haven't gotten there yet. This is not just a, a cultural movement where we are catching the bad eggs who slipped through and now having this great reckoning, but in fact we're still in the process of manufacturing these values every day for our current young people and family members and defending them in older generations. Um, one thing that came to mind professionally, I represented a tenant who had sued her landlord for sexually assaulting her and trying to trade sex for rent or threaten eviction. Um, in that litigation, defense counsel, so not the landlord, but seemingly um, held to different standards, defense counsel served written demands, including that we account for every man that she had ever accused of harassment in her life and account for who the father of her children were, as if that were somehow relevant to their case, that if she had had children with multiple men, she was somehow a less credible reporter for this instance that was happening. 
Just this year, I watched as a defense attorney argued to a jury that um, minor victims of child pornography had kind of been asking for it by going to this person's house late at night. And so I don't think we have gotten to the point where people know now, well, those are old views. We now know not to have them. Um, I think that they're still very much uh, at large and things that we need to be examining in our own lives. Um, another theme that has come to mind in the last few days as I've thought about this is that the consequences for people who use their voice to talk about their own experiences or who try to uplift others who report um, are still far too high. Whether that's retaliation in the workplace, either formal retaliation or the softer version of we're not going to invite them out to drinks because they can't take a joke, we're not going to give them those opportunities because they're seen as a liability for speaking out. I think that that's still very high and often slips through the cracks. Uh, I have a, a personal tie to this recently that I am a defendant in a defamation lawsuit, uh, which is pending before the same federal judges that I practice in front of because myself and several other women uh, used our social media platforms to report a serial local predator who has been accused of rape, who is now in jail for stalking some other women. Um, but just the process of saying, hey, this is a person who the system has not held accountable, has now landed us all in a federal lawsuit, which if we did not have pro bono attorneys, um, I didn't at first, and those bills racked up pretty high, even for me as a seasoned attorney. And so the barriers for other women, I don't say that to discourage people, but just to know we have opportunities to evaluate. Are our systems helping uphold perpetrators, or are they supporting survivors or people who disrupt the system? Um, and if it is potentially bogging people who report down in um, legal fees or administrative hurdles, that can have a very chilling effect that keeps these problems prevailing. Um, but on the flip side of that, I think we all have a giant opportunity every day. And so I, I do want to leave you all with, and I think we'll talk more about reasons to be optimistic. Um, there is an enormous opportunity for education that we have not yet fully embraced. And I think that can start extremely young. It doesn't mean you have to talk to young children about sexual violence, but I'm seeing more and more parents modeling, teaching children about basic body autonomy, basic respect, and less and less enforcing the idea that certain behavior for certain genders is okay, and other genders are gonna be held to different standards. I'm, I'm really encouraged by the young parents and teachers that I've seen really taking seriously that every touch point, every media story, every movie, every reaction to a possible disciplinary setting can be an opportunity to groom children in very healthy ways or in unhealthy ways. And I think that the Me Too movement is one where we are going to have lingering effects that are a tipping point, um, that, that I don't think we're going to revert back to where we just pretend these issues don't exist. Um, I, I will say, uh, I, I appreciated the remarks that we need to be careful about uh, punishment being fair, but I do want to kind of push back also though on Carolyn's um, fundamental fairness and remind people to be creative in how we think about fundamental fairness. And I don't mean creative like flippant, but remembering that the system has not been fundamentally fair ever. That, that the systems we're talking about, whether it's legal due process for a criminal justice system or administrative due process or campuses dealing with assault, haven't been working fairly. And that's why there has been so much silence. That's why there is only when there is this massive widespread opportunity to talk somewhat consequence free that so many people feel invited to come out of the woodwork seemingly for the first time. Um, this group that exists locally and I think is spreading, it's called uh, Break the Silence, a really brave rape survivor founded it locally named Sarah Super, uh, does truth-telling events and invites people to come and talk about either specifics of what happened to them or simply to name themselves as survivors of sexual violence. And what strikes me is every one of those events, there are men and women in their 60s, 70s, and beyond saying, this happened to me when I was young and this is the first time I felt like I could say something or I tried to say something and here's how badly that went for me, I didn't get justice. So I agree that fundamental fairness is important, but I would push back and say we haven't seen what that model might look like yet. Um, and it probably is not simply exhausting the same systems that we've already seen fail survivors year in and year out for so many decades. 
Um, so I'll, I'll end on the remark that we have a big responsibility individually. Um, every time you comment on the way a woman dresses or deserves disrespect, depending on how she presents herself, every time you comment on a public story or a newspaper writes about a public story of sexual violence, the language we use and the ways we make ourselves either safe or not safe for someone to entrust can affect everyone in your life who might secretly be looking to you or to your organization or your department or your household as a safe space. And so I hope that if nothing else tonight, everyone leaves inspired to be a positive part of this movement rather than a pushback on this movement to make sure that current and future survivors have a place to go. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Lindsay, for sharing that. Um, for the past few months, I've been serving as the undergraduate student body president. Um, one of the big aspects of this role is actually meeting with students. Um, and when there's 30,000 students, um, it is a really big aspect of the role. Um, and what, what has struck me in the past few months um, during these numerous conversations I've had is how many students male or female, um, first years or fourth years, how many of them bring up the issue, um, more so the climate of sexual misconduct, not only on our campus, but just nationally. It's an issue at the forefront of the minds of many, many students. Almost a year ago, um, we saw the Me Too movement really take over the internet. Uh, it was inspiring to see so many people and individuals come forward and share their stories. And at the same time, it was eye-opening. Eye-opening um, because I knew the statistics. I knew how many people were affected by sexual violence, but I didn't know all their stories. We didn't know all their stories. And when they came forward and shared their stories, um, my jaw dropped. Because I never, ever, ever thought we'd live in a world where so many people could openly share their stories, in a world where individuals could come together and stand in solidarity around their shared experiences. Because at that point in time, early 2016, um, 2017, the president of our country had been accused of sexual misconduct on numerous occasions. On our own campus, a young woman had been sexually assaulted by several members, then members, of our football team. We saw a prominent member of our basketball team be accused of sexual assault. And we saw really, really high numbers of sexual misconduct on our campus. And most importantly, we saw the barriers and hurdles these women repeatedly faced as they tried to tell their stories. They were called liars, they were called attention seekers, and well, they were called a lot of names worse than that. So yes, at that point, I never thought, I would have never believed that something like the Me Too movement could take off. And yet it did. People from across the world came together to share their stories and to stand in solidarity. And it also brings my heart a lot of joy to see the Me Too movement take off in my home country of India, um, where a lot of conversations are happening right now. Um, in places where sexual violence is as taboo as the topic gets. So I asked myself, why did a movement like the Me Too movement take off? And I think I was watching the Toronto Burke uh, TED Talk that was released recently, where she answered the question eloquently um, and explained, um, to paraphrase a little bit, the movement took off because of and continues to be propelled forward by the power of possibility. She explained that the most powerful movements are built around what is possible, not what is currently present. And in this case, what is possible is a world without sexual violence and a world where every single person's humanity is respected. And so that's why I'm convinced to answer the prompt of this panel that the Me Too movement is not momentary, that it's monumental, because there will always be people who believe in the power of possibility. Advocacy around sexual violence did not begin with the Me Too movement, and it won't end with the Me Too movement. 
I know that people, both survivors and advocates, always have and will always continue to do great work. For example, even before the Me Too movement, students and community members came together um, after the case with the football players to pressure our university to fire Coach Clays, our then head football coach at the time, because of his failure to respond to the incident within his own team. And now with the movement, we still continue to do a lot of advocacy. So while our advocacy hasn't changed, um, we've noticed one thing. We've noticed that the way people respond to our advocacy has changed. Prior to the Me Too movement, a lot of our conversations were around why this matters, why these stories matter, um, why people should even listen to these changes being needed. And now, it's almost as if all those doors opened. People know why it matters. Um, or it's so easy to get meetings. It's so easy to convince people why change is needed. And so in that way, I think the Me Too movement really catalyzed changes. So currently, um, our student government has really, really prioritized uh, advocating around sexual misconduct. We formed a sexual assault task force last year and did a lot of great work, um, specifically around changing the athletics policy to further reinstate why being an athlete is a privilege and not a right. Calling for additional support at the Aurora Center, specifically support for students from marginalized groups who face disproportionate amounts of sexual violence. We called to introduce a more survivor-focused reporting mechanism called Callisto. And now we are working to reinforce resources through <coughs> mandatory language and syllabi, create more robust student group policies on sexual misconduct, um, and specifically, very timely, we're working to respond to the proposed changes to the Title IX section of the Education Amendments Act. These changes that were proposed recently would limit the definition of sexual harassment, give institutions the opportunity to heighten the standard of proof, and remove institutional requirements to investigate off-campus incidents. Even with all this work, even with working this hard on these issues, from time to time we still feel lost and defeated. We felt lost and defeated very recently when the Title IX public comment period was perfectly timed over Thanksgiving break, finals, and winter break. The 60-day period of which most days fall within breaks. I believe that once students come back, we'll have exactly six days on campus while the common period is still open. How do you mobilize students who are the people who are affected by this policy change when they're not even on campus? Yet we're still planning. We're working on it. Uh, we're planning a vigil. We're planning a comment bank. We're doing a lot of work nationally to partner with other campuses to come together uh, to talk to our legislators. And we keep fighting. We keep advocating. Because, well, a recent college health survey um, actually found, that was conducted by our university, that nearly two in five female identifying students at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities indicate that they experienced a sexual assault within their lifetime. Two in five. Wow. With 11.1% experiencing an assault within the past 12 months. It's a statistic, right, but it's also the stories that keep us moving forward. And that's why when we feel lost and defeated, we think about these stories, we think about these statistics, and we keep going. And that's why I believe we can do better and that a better world is possible. So the Me Too movement, in those ways to me, was monumental because it reminded me what is possible and how many people are standing together to create a better campus. My name is Mariam, and I'm sure most of you are wondering what this Muslim woman is doing here, because Muslim men can marry four wives, and that's abuse itself, right? <laughs> that's probably what you are thinking. And so I wanted to uh, talk not necessarily a work that I'm doing with this movement, but my experience as a Muslim woman, and also as uh, 
uh, my colleagues say, you know, this is an international movement now. And so how do we make sure that this movement does not run away, that we keep bring it back to make sure that some of us can follow it? And so we kind of keep feeding the different groups that are entering it from different perspective, different culture, and different ways of really uh, uh, this movement to have meaning for it. So I want to give you a different perspective, not examples. So I want to use myself, and then I will talk about uh, the culture in different groups that I live with. And so I'm a Muslim woman. I grew up in Somalia, and uh, I came to America in my early 20s uh, for a graduate school. And so you may not believe, but Somalia, women can go to school with men. And so there were actually parameters of how men can approach us. And it's not like the government created it. It was the culture. So a man cannot harass a woman who is not her relative. I am not saying that maybe it didn't happen in the household. It didn't happen in the network of the families because that may not be come out, but it happened, it wouldn't happen outside because your brother or your cousin or your relative who's a male will not allow it. It was part of the culture. And so it can start a whole war among different clans because some man decided to do something wrong to a woman. So that was really something that we had in Somalia. It has nothing to do with a lawyer or a government policy, but it was part of the culture. And that's the time I was growing up, and I'm in, in my late 50s. I don't know what's happening now in, back in the country. But as I came to America, I felt what a freedom. I remember when I was interviewed for my scholarship, there were six men and one woman who interviewed me, and the woman was an American. And the six men were discussing my fate and who is going to marry me instead of sending me to America. That was typically the culture, and I accepted it. And they were all talking, you know, I have a wife, this young girl who graduated from college in Somalia. We can't send her to America. She will marry a, an infidel, so we need to keep her here. That was really normal in how I grew up. So when I came to America, and I felt, wow, what a freedom. I came to the freedom land, and I went to college, and my degree was in statistics, and I realized that there were not many women. And I asked it around, and I realized that women were not expected to be good in math and science, even in America. And that was a shock for me. So to me, what I want to then talk about academically, I felt in America was not different than my country. So this movement, Me Too, that we are so excited about it, has a long history, as Sarah discussed about it in, 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 the, in, in her opening, but it really, it, ha it was in everywhere. It's in academics. It's at the workplace. It's in the culture of everywhere you go in America, but in a silent way. And I really wanted to engage women who are my age or even older to realize the role we play ourselves. We were groomed to be good wives, a good mother. If your husband can afford it, you stay home to take care of the children. What does that send a signal to your child, to your daughter? We always, uh, I, w I grew up, you know, my father had six girls in a row, and that was a bad omen in my family because he's supposed to have a boy. I mean, these are all things that you grew up with, and you have it in your, ingrained in your blood. And really, it's not going to go away easily with a Me Too movement that happened yesterday. So I think it's our challenge for women to play a role of how we raise our children. Are we raising the boys and the girls equally? And if not, what parameters, what are we teaching our boys? I know uh, when you watch movies or you talk to people in my age, used to be a gentleman is the one who pays the dinner, who gives the girl gifts, who opens the door for a woman, okay? That's a gentleman. But we, we teach them that. We never taught them, teach them how to really behave in front of a girl that he's working with. So we work, America is so, have been progressive in really educating women. The girls then come to the workforce and they're highly educated, but there are no parameters at the, work, uh, at the workplace, how the guy's supposed to behave, because he, is, he has mixed signals what he thinks about a woman. And that is really, to me, is a role we need to play and say, how do we change that? How do we go back? For me, this Me Too movement has been 
what did I do wrong? Did I do wrong because I have two boys, one of them 29 and 20, 27 one, and then my daughter is 26. And this Me Too movement helping me to realize and say, okay, I need to read this. Did I do something wrong how I raised my boys? I don't want them to behave certain ways, but maybe it's too late for me. But that's a reality for all of us who really are part of uh, this Me Too movement. We all support it, but we need to play our role in doing so. Now, uh, Sarah talked about uh, uh, you know, the vision of, of, of me, uh, me, uh, me Too movement. I really think the Me Too movement is beautiful and I love it, but we need to be aware that we're not leaving so many people behind because they are coming from a different cultures, they're coming from different faiths, they have different understanding of what this movement is all about. And so we need to be aware, how do we then really playing a role in, in informing those who are very active daily and trying to you know, work for the movement? or those who are feeding the movement. All the cases we hear tonight, I don't know how many women who are Muslims who probably have been raped in America who will come forward and tell you that this has happened to me. How many other women who are minority will come out and say, I have been sexually abused because there are ways and cultures embedded in these people who won't allow them to talk about their, their crisis and to talk about their issues because they were raised differently. They have been seen things differently. And it's not something that goes away because now we have Me Too movement. It's, it's that education we need to develop for young girls in, who are not part of this. I mean, I know my daughter is like this beautiful two girls who understand this, but not everybody does that. And so my conclusion is to create a long vision for Me Too, let's not forget culture plays a role, let's not forget Faith plays a role, and let's not forget, people who are coming to our country, they come into it, and we need to make sure we're helping this young woman. For example, I'm ethnic Somali. Most of the women who come here are women who are the households of all these children. What role, what role can they play to help their boys and girls to really uh, uh, kind of educate them about this Me Too movement? How do we make sure that they understand they're not in Somalia, they're here, and there are so many things that are available and resources available if they see something they don't like? And so we, we, we need just to need to be aware of that, and that's where I stop. Thank you. <laughs> so we have uh, a few minutes to bounce around amongst ourselves. Um, and I have to say there are several points that stood out to me. So I just want to lift up a few things that, that I heard from you about what we need to be talking about. And perhaps you can um, decide where to jump in. Um, you know, the, the um, Carolyn was clear about the importance of voice and the importance of being heard and getting a response and having some powers that be be able to kind of call, call to account. Um, we have some of that. We don't have enough of that. And that's, that's a, a thing that needs working on. I was really struck that Lindsay talked about the fact that we're still manufacturing these values. That seemed to me in some ways one of the most fundamental things, that if we talk about a vision, it's not some static thing that we already have. We're trying to live our way into them and figure out how to communicate them effectively as parents, as teachers, as advocates. Um, as people who want to change the norm so that it is like smoking a cigar in the <laughs> office and people say, nah, you can't do that here. But, but to move us towards that, um, I was very heartened to hear uh, Simran talk about the fact that at least right now, there is a shift in the response that student advocates get from the powers that be. I worry that that's temporary. 
Me too. Because of the way our culture turns things over and gets the crisis of the day. But it's, it's really good. So the, my question for you is, how do we best use this opportunity? And you have a long list of things you've yeah. been working for. But um, as we live into a change that we haven't fully fleshed out, we also have to seize the opportunities that are there. And we have to be very aware that this vision we are trying to manufacture is something we need to transmit not only across generations so that young people are socialized differently, but we are an incredibly diverse country. And so you're bringing to us the fact that, and in our discussion over dinner, what became clear is we were, we were literally getting to know each other, some of us, for the first time. And I realized that when Miriam spoke, um, we had a movement through time from Carol, that's how we ordered the panel, sort of through time with generations of women engaged with these issues. And then Miriam spoke and there was like a time warp for her. She grew up in Somalia and came here and boom, she's dropped in the middle of what for us is a multi-generational process of changes in women's roles and backlash against them and, and learning to deal with them. Um, but, but that is the nature of American society, is that we always have a, a new wave of people coming in with all of who they are. And so to find ways to empower those women as well without just wagging our fingers and saying there's something bad about your culture is really, really crucial. So who wants to step in to, you know, respond, either carry a thought further or respond to what one of the others said? Sarah, I thought you posed a really interesting question about how do we best use this time and the support that we have right now in the case that this Me Too movement or the traction that we're gaining is momentary. Um, and that's a question that a lot of student leaders have been wrangling with and I know a lot of university leaders have been wrangling with and really I think the solution lies in prioritizing and setting the stage for sustainable cultural change. And that's why this year we're prioritizing as much as we can changes to policy and even changes to legislation. So one of the things that we're hoping to accomplish, given these shifts in um, not only the face of our legislature, um, but just generally the conversations we're having, hoping to expand medical amnesty to include victim survivors um, of sexual assault. Um, and so that's what a lot of our conversations have actually been focused on, is when we stop doing the work, or when people stop doing the work, or when people stop listening, how does this continue? And the answer is not, one thing or two things. It really has to be a long-term commitment to doing this work, to prioritizing culture change. And I think students and faculty and staff are really, really striving to get there. Good. And how do you manufacture a new culture? <laughs> oh, well, I'm let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think there's a lot of pieces. If we think about like what do we individually, what are we able to do, um, I, I don't think we're done with the storytelling portion. I think it can be easy, especially for people who haven't yet been part of a storytelling storytelling setting. Maybe they saw the Facebook posts earlier this year and last year. Maybe they've seen events come and go and they felt like, well, I haven't done it yet. That was the window. We're now moved on to the institutional change parts or the system changes. Uh, but I think there's actually, uh, I'm an attorney and I have no neurology background at all or neuroscience, but I, there's supposedly a neuroscience foundation for the idea that storytelling is how we learn. It's how we teach. Um, being presented with a bullet list is not as effective as a narrative. Uh, it's just not how the average person learns and internalizes change. And so we are not done with inviting and supporting storytelling. And that doesn't mean everyone has an obligation to parade out their traumas. And it doesn't mean you should just go up to the next person you see and say, gosh, tell me about your worst memory. Um, but I think we need to continue creating those spaces and not assume that that work was done last year just because it happened in a big swoop last year. It's an ongoing, um, especially for parents who have never had an opportunity to ask your children, um, has anyone made you feel unsafe? What about this month? What about this month? Um, because trauma happens all the time uh, with people close to you. 
Um, and you don't want to create a life of fear, but you also want to remember the burden to being the one to volunteer a story is much higher than hearing someone else tell a story or create a space and then feel safe doing it. Um, the other piece that I'll say on culture change is I think it takes a lot of different kinds of voices. Our panel represents a relatively narrow range of those voices. Um, we are all relatively educated. Um, I don't know everyone's backgrounds, but um, we, we don't have the panoply of experiences represented here. Um, what I really find frustrating is when all the well-intentioned people in rooms like this go forth into the world and then tone police people who might either tell their stories or demand change in a less palatable way. And I think you posed the question at the beginning, how do we engage our male allies? Uh, I'm not saying that male allies don't matter, especially since there might be a lot of male survivors who don't even recognize that they are survivors because of the cultural stigma, uh, the heightened stigma there. Um, but frankly, I think um, I've seen instances where even extremely neutral, anonymized, not telling the name or showing a picture or giving any identifying details, simply saying there is a person I know who did this thing, a man I know who did this thing, can result in waves upon waves of um, horrible harassment against women, asking why are you trying to ruin these men's lives, why are you being so hysterical, why can't you take a joke, et cetera. So I, I don't think there is actually a tone we can strike that raises our voice at all without, I, I think the ultimate goal is they'd rather we keep it to ourselves. Um, I don't think you can actually package some of these messages in a way that's palatable to everyone or inviting to everyone. And so I'd way rather see us support our radical voices. It doesn't mean I need to be the one that does a topless march or that uses expletives in my advocacy. Um, but I really would like to see other kind of middle of the road, I'm kind of feminist, but I'm not one of those radical women people supporting the radical voices because they're doing some of the harder work that maybe we are not in a position to do or don't feel is appropriate for our voice, but that's part, like a, if we're thinking about a cultural wave, it's made up of a lot of currents. And some of them have to be the one that you might not want to stand right next to at the protest, but they're important too and make space for all of it. There's always a leading edge <laughs> right. of change. Carolyn, do you want to respond to some of that? Well, um, as far as culture change, I like to think about discussions not just telling our stories. Mm -hmm. So I like to think about the power in a workplace of, I mean, back in the 70s we had, what, support groups or women got together and, and also speak outs. speak outs and we, and we told these stories. And it's important, it's really important. But I think about what um, Simran has said about the ongoing work at the university and what Miriam has said about young people coming to the workplace and not having been oriented. And I wonder if there can't be more conversations in the institution about what creeps me out. I'm sorry, this is something I don't like. You know, some discussions between ignoring it and throwing the book at somebody. <laughs> You know, some discussions about educating people about the various boundaries, and we have different ones as different people, um, as a way to enlist some kind of common, com shared norm about how we're going to expect each other to behave in this space and in this, uh, in this institution. Yeah, and Miriam, how would you bring, I mean, specifically because this is the group you know, Somali women, into a conversation like this? Wow, that's a tough one. I think I like the idea of, you know, we somehow, I remember I used to work for a foundation called the McKnight Foundation. Mm -hmm. And I work in the early childhood where, um, uh, school readiness, kindergarten school readiness. Well, there are ways uh, you prepare a child to be ready for kindergarten, right? I remember realizing so many people did not know what that meant, who did not know what that means in, in some new, new Americans who were in this country. And so giving them a list of your child when he's four and a half or five, these are the things he or she needs to know. 
So something so easy like that is what, how do you really help these people to see the value and say, okay, this is what needs to happen. This is what I need to teach my daughter. This is what I need. And I don't think they don't have anything because I grew up, not anyone, nobody told me about how I, I, I was told how I value myself, but nobody prepared me to go when I was graduate school to someone say to me, well, how come, how come you get straight A's in math and stats? And I didn't know how to answer to that question. But then if I knew the history of women not being good in this, for whatever the reason, I think they're good at it. It's, just, it's the myth that people think that it's men who can be good at this. Uh, but nobody, and I didn't know, I didn't understand it. And it was my male American friend who helped me and said, you know, in this culture, they think women are not the engineers or they're not the statisticians. This is how, of course, it has changed. But that was really, this is 1980s when I came to America. And so to me, the way we can help uh, women who are not aware, I don't think many new Americans are aware of Me Too movement. Their kids are aware of it, but they are not aware. But we do service for them by really giving them small tools to see the value of what Me Too movement stands for. That's how I look at and it. And perhaps there could be environments where they could tell each, each other, other their yes. story. Yes, which you're right, know you're right. So crucial. Mm -hmm. Can we bring up the house lights so that um, everybody here can see each other? Because at this point, there are, I think, a couple of microphones walking up and down the aisles. And I'd like to invite those of you here to respond to the problems we've been laying out, some of the thoughts coming from the panel, thoughts you walked in with and you think you wished somebody was going to say and we didn't get there, whatever. I have a question for the panel and it um, really reflects some of the changes going on at the university right now. I'm a professor at the university, and we've been informed that as uh, professors and the, uh, along with the staff, we are now mandated reporters. So if a student comes to us and shares with us a story of sexual misconduct, we must uh, call the Title IX officer and give the officer that student's name and, and uh, information. And I'm wondering what the panel thinks about that. Is that going to further silence victim survivors who may think they're losing their agency? Or is that going to provide additional resources for victim survivors. What's your response to that? You know, there are two panel members with direct experience with this institution, Carolyn and yeah. Samara. Um, I, I mean, I can speak a little bit to this decision. Um, I know it was made in consultation uh, with a renowned, uh, nationally renowned uh, sexual assault on campus uh, prevention worker by the name of Dr. Alan Berkowitz. Um, and I think a lot of the conversations and a lot of those concerns were raised by students is what happens if students no longer feel comfortable reporting to the people, the faculty, the staff, the student, the student employees in their life um, about sexual assault that they may, may have experienced. And the answer that we heard back countless times from countless experts is mandatory reporting is good as long as there are places and spaces on our campus where people can still report confidentiality. Con confidentially. And we have the Aurora Center and we have off-campus resources where people can do that. Um, and I think that's where the balance is, is ensuring that we have really, really strong confidential resources for students and faculty and staff um, if we're going to mandate reporting um, from employees mm -hmm. on our campus. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I, I agree that um, it's very important to have confidential resources and uh, psychiatrists, psychologists um, have that kind of relationship with their clients or their patients and they can be people who can provide advice without running into that mandatory reporting uh, piece. Um, I think it's, 
Personally, I think it's quite unfortunate uh, to have mandatory reporting that will cause a faculty member who is a trusted kind of advisor to say, don't say anything more, uh, because you know, if it has to do with something about sexual misconduct, I am going to have to report. I think that mechanistic um, approach is very limiting, and it, it kind of does a big disservice to the fabric of a university environment and the fabric of, of um, the teaching we're trying to do. Um, I used to try to navigate that by when working with someone who was talking about matters I felt needed to be reported, both letting them know of the duty, I, and I didn't, in our office, that Office of Conflict Resolution, we actually said, we announced we didn't have a duty because of the confidentiality of that kind of process, but um, I would try and work with the person to get them to the point where they were comfortable that it, we were going to report it. And that was a very, you know, that was a very successful strategy. And, and accompany them, you know, and explain and lay a groundwork. And so that it was not something that was being done to them without their agency. Um, but, you know, I don't think the Office of General Counsel would have approved <clears throat> of that approach. Mm -hmm. just, to, just to inform you, we must now put that in our syllabus. You're now, uh, th th that is a, an issue, yeah. It's in the syllabus, is there? Another? Um, thank you so much for being on the panel and for your insights tonight. Um, I. Uh, heard a little bit about this from one of the panelists, but just wondering if you have any um, insights on uh, policy, um, what sort of policies legislatively um, could be pursued to help um, kind of move forward on prevention, education, um, social, uh, restorative justice, any sort of ideas that you have for um, how we can make things uh, better in terms of prevention and then um, in terms of um, serving victims and survivors. Can you repeat the question? <laughs> I'm not sure I fully understood because this system muffles uh, words. But you're asking for people to <coughs> offer any specific recommendations they have for policies that will move us further down, further towards the goal. Policies that become, way, just like it was really important to make sexual harassment a legal concept and put it in a law so you could have some redress, right? That kind of thing, am I? Yep. Okay. And so I, I think our modest question asker is actually a recently elected Minnesota lawmaker. Thank you for being here, Amy. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's, it's uh, speak, speak up. Yeah, speak step, yes, go step go one it. is to have lawmakers ask that question. Um, mm -hmm. And I know that, uh, just personally, that Amy will be a really great uh, leader in this and many other arenas. Um, I, some that come to mind, some that I obviously selfishly would have loved to see kick in a while ago. Um, I think that we are going to continue to see defamation law used as a weaponized reaction to people reporting sexual violence. I don't think there is a historic precedent for that in the past because um, people who engage in abusive conduct have historically relied on the silence of their victims and so they didn't need to wield a lot of legal tools. They could just sit back and enjoy quiet. Um, now that quiet is not going to be the standard response as much, I think their next power grab is to use existing legal frameworks that haven't really been modeled to deal with social reporting, um, reporting in campus settings. I think students already across the country are getting sued for defamation, hopefully not at a rate that's actually chilling, but I think one legislative thing we might need to see is creating some um, recognized uh, there's, there's a concept of immunity or privilege, not absolute immunity that people can go on a wanton rampage of accusing everyone of things, but recognizing that false accusation is a very low incidence problem. Um, we might need to reconfigure defamation law to recognize that. 
Um, and I'm also seeing really encouraging moves to change the statute of limitations for reporting or eliminate statute of limitations for reporting on um, particularly kinds of abuse that are very prone to delayed reporting, namely childhood sexual abuse and sexual assault and rape, um, that it can take many years for people to even recognize what's happened to them as a crime. Um, they might not be seeking criminal or carceral responses to it, but um, knowing that they have options I think is really important. I think I, I briefly mentioned um, medical amnesty as I was talking, and we're actually planning to bring that when the next lecture. Can you explain what yes. medical amnesty yes, yes, is? Yes, definitely. Um, we live in our own world. So yeah. medical amnesty uh, basically provides amnesty or forgiveness uh, to uh, the individual uh, calling in in the case of a medical emergency, um, specifically related to uh, overuse of alcohol. Um, the person calling in and the person who is facing that medical emergency. So two people, um, so they're not charged with underage drinking um, and can call for help. Um, and so the ask is to expand this policy to also include victim survivors of sexual assault um, so that there's less barriers to reporting um, and also include um, non-alcohol related substances in the categorization of medical emergencies. And we're planning to bring that in the le next, this upcoming legislative session. So your support would be invaluable. <laughs> mm -hmm. I don't think, oh, I'm sorry, Mary. I, I don't think there's a, so much a policy, but I do think one of the backlash things that women are experiencing, uh, and this is, uh, professional women are experiencing this, which is the prominence of this Pence rule which is you don't, take, you don't go out to dinner with a woman colleague if your wife isn't there. <laughs> um, you aren't going to go to an overnight conference. Uh, and, and this feeling that the women are not gonna get the mentoring or the relationships with the senior men who are in fact the senior powers in these organizations uh, out of this kind of fear. So it's just something I worry about. Of course, it's illegal. If you, if you are taking young men and mentoring young men and taking them out to dinner, then you cannot say, I'm not gonna do that for women. But there needs to be some awareness of that that isn't in the culture right now. Did you? No. Okay. Uh, panelists, thank you for your wise comments tonight. Um, obliquely, uh, one or more of you talked about the public culture in our country today. We have a person in office in the presidency is a, who is an accused sexual predator. We've had these, uh, this business with uh, Mr. Kavanaugh and his accuser not being, uh, not being believed. Uh, and we talked a little bit, you all talked a little bit about aggregation of voices, the aggregate uh, power of multiple voices when they're brought to bear. And I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about ways that people who are not directly professionally involved in the issue, uh, ways that voices can be aggregated in order to make the issue less momentary and more momentous and ongoing. Um, I think it's step one is to think about what your own spaces are. So if you are um, someone who does not work but you spend a lot of time in your neighborhood or your community, what are the age groups that you most often have in reach? If you are in a workplace, what's your role in the workplace? Um, no one necessarily wants to take every non-sexual violence conversation space and just announce one day unilaterally, today is the day we're talking about this issue. I think um, that can also be harmful, but if you evaluate what, what are the spaces that I'm in in my community and where might these things happen? So one just subtle example, um, there's an increase in bystander training 
among service staff. And a lot of bars and restaurants are starting to take it very seriously that um, alcohol is not the reason that sexual harassment or sexual assault occur, but it is a frequent tool of sexual assaulters and perpetrators. And so if they can train their staff on how to recognize someone who is trying to compromise the person they're with and overserve their date, or if they can notice someone who's in distress and intervene, how many sexual assaults can be prevented at that level? Um, similarly, there's bystander training at campuses, I understand, to deal with. If you're in a party setting and you see someone you don't even know but something just looks a little off or you see harassment in a public space and it looks a little off, what are the safest, most productive ways? Um, and if you're at an organization, you can just say, gosh, even though maybe we're all at a certain age where we think that this is, we're not hanging out at bars or we're not in a party scene or, or we don't see ourselves as potential victims, um, what can we do in our workplace or what, what connection might we have? That might be a group of people who, are, who missed this cultural wave, uh, who didn't get an opportunity to tell their story or who don't know how to talk to their own children. And there are a lot of really skilled speakers that your organization or school or workplace or church can say, we might not know why this affects us, but we sense it does. Let's look into speakers or resources that we could bring in for an event, give folks a heads up so they can opt out if it is too painful. Um, but I think there's just a lot of community conversations that you don't even realize there's room to have, but if you suggest it or others around you do, um, there's a lot of speakers who are happy to come in for free and lead workshops to just figure out what your connection to this issue might be. It, it strikes me too that there are a lot of conversations that we could be having in everyday life that address what just suddenly popped in my head is the empathy gap. The fact that um, we have very different experiences, and some of the storytelling most women react with, oh yeah, I believe that, that something like that happened to me, or something like that could have happened to me. Um, but I think for people who don't, who don't live in that reality, it's a, the conversation you were talking about, what creeps me out, that kind of, at, even at that level, and this can be very informal. It, it's really important that these are conversations where you just sort of speak your truth without saying, you did this to me. I mean, if somebody does that to you, then they do it and you say, that creeps me out. And then hope that you get listened to. But there'll be, there are a lot of kinds of things that women talk about amongst themselves. and. We need to have more of those conversations pushed out, I think, into to more public spaces. Another hand. Oh boy, okay, forgive me. I've been sitting here for about 10 minutes with 8,000 different questions <laughs> rattling around in my brain going, okay, you gotta whittle that down to like one, maybe two. Um, Oh, man, I evolve on me too every minute of every day. I'm 37, so I find myself in this weird, I don't know what generation I am, post-millennial. I think I'm below X, but I'm sort of like, <laughs> I, sort of like I sort of was in this weird, like I kind of got the weird Catherine Deneuve sort of what happens to flirting vibe, but then I also had this like, wait a second, no, <laughs> that's, that's terrible. That's not what flirting is at all. So I go all over on this. Um, and, oh man, I guess I'll go with, uh, with sort of, wait for it, what about the men? Um, I know they are historically been doing, doing all right, but they do have a role to play in this, or at least our engagement with them on this topic. Um, I know that for a lot of women, a lot of people, Brett Kavanaugh was pretty awful. Um, and but I don't think we can ignore, there was a large subset of women who backlashed very violently against what they saw as what was happening to him because they had this sort of fear on behalf of right, the men in their lives and their sons. And I don't think we can ignore that, as frustrating as it may be. Mm -hmm. I think it is important and fair to acknowledge that yeah, it is actually scary out there for some men, some young men. I have nephews. And they aren't rapists, but of, of course they aren't. But I just, I don't think we can say that it's not, 
that there isn't fear out there. And I'm wondering about how men on campus feel, how fellow students, male students feel about the environment right now, how they're handling it, um, how they feel they're navigating it, and how the campus, how administrators, how we can all help the men in our lives navigate what is a rapidly something that's shifting beneath our feet. I'd like to be better at it myself. I, 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 I didn't hear it entirely, but I think she was asking a question about, about the men on campus, yeah. in part. In part, right. So I'm, I'm thinking about the men I know on campus. Um, I'm thinking about men I know who really care about these issues. Mm -hmm. And I think where the gap is, so I mentioned uh, that we have a sexual assault task force that does a lot of this work and the advocacy that we're talking about is really driven by the sexual assault task force. It started last year, it's continuing this year. Last year we started with five male members on the task force. By the end of it, there were none left. This year we started with five. Just already, no one's in it anymore. And I'm not sure what the issue is, and maybe it's the way the task force is set up, or maybe it's them feeling like they don't have a space, but I've heard on countless occasions from the people who left is they didn't feel like this was their work, and they felt like they were taking up too much space. And I think it's that misconception that we have to work to eradicate. Mm -hmm. It's like we need allies to show up, because it's them showing up that's going to help create a change. Um, I, I think about how the men that even came to the task force, they thought their job was solely engaging other men, male engagement. But it doesn't have to be. It can be so much broader. It can be creating campaigns. It can be writing legislation. It can be so many different things. It doesn't have to focus on engaging other men. And so I think people care on this campus. I think male identifying students care on this campus. I just think we need to find a better way and a better venue for them to be able to engage with this issue and enforce that this is everyone's everyday work. Um, you know, my knee-jerk reaction, and sometimes I'm a little tongue-in-cheek about it, but is I don't care. <laughs> that, that we're not going to... Men have, as you noted, men have been in charge historically of this issue. They have not taken it seriously enough to see the changes that we needed and that now it's kind of time for other people more directly affected to take hold of the work. But I heard kind of two parts in your question that I think are worth a non-tongue-in-cheek um, and a little less dismissive of a response, which is both, what about the people afraid for, their, for the men in their life that they will be accused? And what are the consequences if we have a culture where an accusation results in the ruination of their lives, and I care about these men, and I don't want to see that happen to them. And then where do men fit into the movement, which I think are two kind of separate questions. To the, to the latter, which I think you've touched on, um, there's a lot of really positive, empowering work on healthy masculinity that you can get young men involved in, that older men are mentoring people in their communities on, that I think is a critical part of this work that doesn't say it is negative to be a male identifying person or, or embracing masculinity. There's a very healthy space for positive, beautiful masculinity to flourish. And so I think if you have a nephew or a brother that you wanna see succeed, um, directing them towards that kind of community and making sure they are not getting sucked into a Twitter vortex of alt-right men's rights activists is a really good way to avoid them falling into sexual misconduct, the reality. And then to your question of what about sexual misconduct, the false accusation? How do I not react negatively to this fear or this looming concept that like it simply takes one word by one woman and then their life is over? I would say education on the reality that that's not a risk is a big step in dispelling that fear. That uh, you know you think about every year people pretend to have cancer to bilk GoFundMe's, and yet when someone says. I've been diagnosed with cancer, no one's knee-jerk reaction is to accuse them of lying, and yet the incidence of false reporting for sexual misconduct is so incredibly low, both on a criminal level and a social level, um, but we still knee-jerk to asking what if she's lying pretty quickly. Um, embracing the fact that all of our loved ones are capable of making someone feel sexually unsafe, and it doesn't necessarily mean they're a monster, but it means we've all come up in a culture that's groomed quite a range of 
hidden misconduct is important to come to terms with this. Most of the male perpetrators that I have seen in criminal settings, their moms and their sisters are in the front row insisting, this couldn't be my boy, and it was. Um, and so I'm not saying that about your nephews, I'm saying that culturally, we need to make space to reconcile that the people we love uh, can also be the people who are hurting others, and how do we get them engaged in positive conversations earlier, um, dispel the knee-jerk myth of thinking that if someone we care about and respect is accused, it must be one of those few lies, and all those other women might be telling the truth, but this might be one of those um, false allegations, and, and really focusing on accepting that we need to see this as not a should we believe when it's someone we care about, but default to believing and building a more positive response um, I, I think that that's, we're, we're all going to be nervous as we reconcile with this cultural problem, but I, I, I don't think we should center men. Yeah, and I, I just wanted to, um, to add that the question I raised about a vision, it has to, in the long run, become a shared vision that includes a healthy masculinity, a healthy feminine, a, a healthy sexuality, um, mutually respecting whatever people choose. Um, and, and we do need growing numbers of men to see that they have a stake in the, that future, that it will be better for them, not worse. It will be way better for them, not worse. And we have to believe that because the, the defensive reaction is, is a stopper. It stops the conversation. It, it means we haven't heard each other yet. So maybe we should develop some really good ways of noticing when that has happened and back off and, and, and train ourselves to say, we haven't understood each other yet. Could you say that again? And can I say this again? And can you, you know, um, because we do need each other to build a different way of being into the future. Um, and that's, that's really crucial. I also want to add that I think we have to be cognizant of the fact that at least some men in our culture have been um, labeled ahead of time as predatory. And I'm thinking of African American men in particular. Um, because of that long history that I was calling up, I just think you can't ignore that that is there. Um, and so I think that the burden even shifts a little bit there. And it, it makes the whole thing extremely complicated, but we need to be aware that we have to hear everybody. I, I just want to say that what I'm hearing all this, I think what Me Too and with the help of all these people and many others around America to create as different tools that will be used as a litmus test for a man to really read and say, okay, do I fit here? What is happening here? Is it me? Is it other man? Something that helps them to really keep them in the conversation or keep them in the meetings they're coming. So not one tool, but different tools for different groups and different generations for to have conversations in neighborhoods will be maybe useful for me too. Yeah. I, I also want to give another analogy, which I don't know if it works, but I'm a white southerner. I grew up in segregation. I was surrounded by people who said, change is going to take a long time. You can't change people's minds and hearts overnight. So just slow down and kind of let, basically they said, let white people figure out that what they're doing is wrong <laughs> in terms of segregation. That was not the way to deal with it. We needed very clear rules. Segregated schools are not constitutional. Active discrimination against people based on race is not acceptable, and there will be penalties if you do it. We have a lot of those laws now. We haven't solved the problem of racism yet. And so there's a whole lot more work to be done that has to do with 
this other side of hearing each other and um, becoming aware of each other's realities. And we live in, in isolated um, settings much too much. So I think, I think we do, we need rules, we need clear, we need consequences, we need, you can't do that. You can't smoke a cigar in my office building. But we also need to find more ways to have the conversations we all have to have. Wendy. I hate to close this out. I want to thank you all for uh, what a thoughtful and an engaging uh, discussion that we've had tonight, inspirational, I would add. And a sincere thanks to all of you for joining us this evening. We hope we'll see you at uh, future uh, Friends of the Library events. And don't forget to uh, sign up if you're not a friend. We'll be sending you a link to the video of tonight's program. Um, we hope you'll share it. We hope you'll comment on it. Send us your feedback as well. And again, we hope to see you in the future. We have a dessert reception out in the, the lobby, in the reception area. And uh, I'm sure our speakers will be out there as well. And you can continue to engage with them. Thank you all, and have a great evening.